Lord, we need you in everything, particularly as we begin to study your word and try to follow it. So be our teacher today, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. A minute or two's review and then we move on. For many years, cultic groups have emphasised that the book of Revelation has much to say about a final great tribulation. In this they are correct. All great classical scholars on the book of Revelation have said the same thing from the beginning of time. But it's only in very recent years that scholars have learnt that the paradigm, the pattern of last day events is found in the last days of the head of the church. In other words, what happened to the head of the church in principle will happen to his body. And of course he had a very great tribulation that we call Calvary. Can I remind you that in the last sermon that he gave, Matthew 24, it centred on the last great tribulation. And he said, unless the days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, the days would be shortened. And then he says, after that tribulation, stars will fall from heaven, meteoric shower sort of thing, heavens will depart as a scroll, and then they'll see the Son of Man coming in great glory with all the hosts of the angels. But now let me take you back. Passion Week, and I confess I'd been studying this book for 30 years before I learnt this very important key. I learnt it at a time when I was spending from 12 to 16 hours a day, at least six days a week, on this book. Now this is the key, that the last week of our Lord's life sets out in principle the last events in the life of the church. So I will briefly review those final events in our Lord's life. It began with a great triumphant proclamation. You remember that. It's often called Palm Sunday, when our Lord, on a steed that kings and judges used to use, but a steed of peace, not of war, because that wasn't a horse, donkey, comes into Jerusalem and polarizes the religious world thereby. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they murmur and they're angry. The people are shouting and calling out Hosanna. And the Pharisees say, stop them, stop them. And our Lord says, if they should stop, the very stones would cry out. And after that event, the Pharisees and the Sadducees unite with Judas to hand Christ over to their worst enemies. Because they had decreed it's expedient one man should die and the nation perish not. The fact was, Christ had challenged their religious views, not their religious views on the Torah or the teachings of the Torah, but their view of God. He pictured God as one that receiveth sinners. He's gone to be guest with him that's a sinner, it says. This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. The Pharisees couldn't stand that. They were big in righteousness, self-righteousness. What they had forgotten was that in the Old Testament, it doesn't say our sins are filthy rags. It says our righteousness is as filthy rags. So all the things on which you and I pride ourselves testify to that pride and condemn us. So the Pharisees were big in outward righteousness. They'd have been fairly good neighbours. They wouldn't have stolen your lawnmower or anything. (coughs) They'd have been good neighbours. But they had no real heart, see. So they hate Christ. They say, it's better he die. Because if he's going to stir up the nation, the Romans will punish us. That's their excuse. So you see a union of church and state. Now that's the pillar point. And before Calvary, there is a union of church and state. And it is preceded 
by apostasy by religious leaders and among Christ's disciples because the one that hands him over is one of the smartest of the apostolic band. You've got to be smart to be a treasurer and make numbers add up. (laughs) He's a very smart guy. He's a very smart guy. So church and state union is the prelude to Calvary and it's triggered by apostasy among prominent church people and even in the little band of Christ, Judas. And notice the opposing religions get together. They think their differences. In our world, we have over 600 Protestant denominations and Catholicism also has many, many divisions. And Judaism has many, many divisions. And it may be news to some, but Mohammedanism has many, many divisions because Mohammedanism is based not just on the Koran but on traditional works about what Muhammad said and did. And then these have to be interpreted by the Islamic lawyers. So you have all sorts of divisions in Hinduism and you have more divisions in Buddhism and so on. It's like the Tower of Babel and the multiplication of tongues. The religious world has always been like that. Wherever you have anything very precious, you've got to remember the words of Shakespeare, lilies fester worse than weeds. The better a thing is, the worse it can become. You take the present conflict. People say, there's religion for you. In Ireland, it's the Protestants against the Catholics. Palestine, the Holy Land. It's the Arabs versus the Israelis. In Bosnia, it's the Mohammedans versus the the Orthodox. Religion, see? You have a clue in the first war the Bible records, which was just one man against one man. Our wars consist of mass murders of civilians. That's what characterizes all 20th century wars following World War One, And there have been scores. There are over 100 minor wars since 1945. And what characterizes them is the mass murder of innocent women and children. See, the Arabs have, for example, learnt that the average Israeli enemy is now a man in a tank and he's rather hard to get at. So now they go in to the centres of population where they can get babies and women because it's a terror campaign. They want to influence the government to permit an Arab free state and surely they've got as much right to it as the Israelis have to a free state. So if you go back to Genesis 4, the first war, one man kills another and it's not over money. It's not over politics. It's not over reputation, it's over religion, how to worship. The first war was over religion. The Bible calls the last war Armageddon. When I was very young, before I was 10, I thought that meant arm again, arm again, but it doesn't. It comes from the Hebrew word Megiddo, which meant amount of slaughter, and the Greek, the Hebrew prefix Ha, H-A, which means mountain. There is no such place as Mount Megiddo. I have been in the valley of Megiddo, but adjoining it is the place where two religions met, Elijah against the prophets of Baal, and whoever answered by fire, <coughs> that one was to be the true God. So the first war of the world is over religion. It's as though the Bible is telling us from the very beginning, religion is important, And it's so important that if it's abused, it becomes a horrible, terrible thing. Now, one of the most famous scientists in the world was a man called Kurt Gadel, G-O-Umlaut, D-E-L. He's the one that set forth the incompleteness theorems, which meant this, that it's absolutely impossible to prove to the ultimate any scientific idea. 
This man was a very religious man, but he said, most religion's bad. I agree with him 100%. Most religion is bad. And less religion makes one Christ-like, kind and tender, compassionate, noble, standing for the truth, caring and so on. It's the wrong thing. It can only lead to the opposite. So when we look at Christ's life in its last week, which is the pattern of the experience of his body, the church, you are familiar that the church is called the body of Christ. It's also called the bride of Christ. And it's important we understand he doesn't have a thousand bodies and a thousand brides. Everyone, whether Catholic or Protestant, dispensationist or non-dispensationist, Everyone that's been converted to Christ is a member of the Church of Christ. The Bible knows nothing about denominations. But in the very experience of our Lord, we find how terrible religion is when it's misused. And the opposing faiths get together. Today we find it impossible to consider how the day could ever come when Hinduism, Mohammedanism, Judaism... Catholicism, Protestantism can unite. But you know, funny things happen when the well-being of society is threatened. Once people are scared, they will subject themselves to any tyrant, any dictator who can bring order at whatever the cost. Now, the most... Some of us remember decades earlier when there was a communist scare and they raked over the coals, all the great Hollywood actors and actresses. I put great in commas. Um, and a certain proportion of them, about 10%, were either jailed or sacked out of fear about communism. The fear even extended to the President of the United States. The President of the United States was afraid to go against the demagoguery being sponsored in the Congress of American government, which brought fear to everyone of prominence. So strange things happen, and things you never anticipate in a civilised world. Just this last week, they have talked about what happened in Severnitsa. You remember, it was a safe haven. And here were about 20,000 plus Muslims with a handful of Dutch UN guardians. And the Serbs came in and said to the UN soldiers, get out of the way. And they got. Otherwise there'd have been a bloodbath. Then you remember they separated the women and children from the men, marched off 8,000 men and murdered them. It is hard for us to conceive the depths of depravity to which the human heart can sink if it's not controlled by the principle of love. We've all heard of the dictators like Idi Amin and so on. Idi Amin cut his wife up in bits, kept her in the fridge and ate her at leisure. King of a vast land. Saddam Hussein. I think it was 1991, murdered 5,000 of his Kurdish inhabitants in the north with poison gas. 5,000 women and children crawling on the ground, their eyes streaming, unable to breathe. 5,000 died. 4 million were exposed to it. See, it's a very, very tough world, Christians. It applies to you and me. The illustration you, you could have heard me use is that we're all like a bottle of water which has an inch of dirt at the bottom that's been standing on the shelf. The water's good enough to drink until you give it a shaking. And when you and I are given a shaking, we're capable of doing anything. So the Bible from the beginning is trying to say, look, be very careful. You have a sinful fallen nature. Unless it's under control of true religion, the principle of love, you will kill. You will kill. 
Now, respectably, people kill other people's reputation or take their business or whatever until the things get intense and then, it, then it's war. So, back to Passion Week. It is not a strange thing that the only Jew who ever kept the Torah perfectly is betrayed by Jews to death. Isn't that amazing? The only Jew who ever kept the Jewish law perfectly, the only Jew who kept the first two great commandments, loved God with all his heart, loved his own, he's handed over to die. What a strange thing. And it's preceded by apostasy among his own. Christ is then tossed into a little time of trouble in Gethsemane. <clears throat> here he weeps tears of blood. And here church and state come to take him. Judas leads the band of the soldiers belonging to the Sanhedrin and the group of Roman soldiers who come to give it bite and steal. So he has a little time of trouble in Gethsemane. And he's not like Socrates, who on the eve of death can say, now don't remember, I owe a chicken to so-and-so, and can talk about death just a hole in the garden wall. Christ is in terrible, terrible concern. Why? He was the most courageous man that ever lived. But the weight of the sins of the world is upon him. And part of that weight of sins of the world is the knowledge that one of his owners betrayed him that the head of the church he instituted have betrayed him, the heads of the church, Caiaphas and Co, you see. So he has a little time of trouble there. That's where his probation closes, when he says, not my will, but thine be done. Then he has a series of trials for the government, and then his great time of trouble on the cross. You may remember C.S. Lewis says, Every moment in the passion is our human experience writ large. And Gethsemane, Christ calls on his friends for help. They fall asleep. Then there's the church he instituted, but the leaders are apostate. Then there's the government, which has a rough form of law and justice, but they wash their hands of him. Oh, someone says, washed his hands instead of exerting them. Later he suicided, according to tradition. But the worst thing comes when God himself slams the door and he cries out, my God, my God, why? So Christ here has the great time of trouble and he has to go to the very bottom of things because he's bearing the weight of the sin of the world. But there is another reason if he, so to speak, paid the pounds, shillings and pence, not the farthings, we wouldn't find him a, a safe guide. To every normal person, there come, there come times when the universe doesn't make sense. <clears throat> to every normal person, there come, come occasions when it seems God has abdicated, that evil triumphs, good doesn't get a look in, and the gears of the universe are clashing madly and wildly and you feel like going mad. And God is not. So Christ experiences that. He experiences the second death, which is separation from God. No one will ever experience the full depths. But the sort of depression that can come to human beings when God is absent, he experiences infinitely. Right, so there's your pattern. Triumphant proclamation, polarizes the religious world, leads to the establishment of apostasy, death decree made against him by the union of church and state, small time of trouble, probation closes, big time of trouble on the cross. Now I want you to notice one other thing. Would you open your Bibles at Mark, the 12th chapter, please? Very quickly we'll notice a characteristic of everything Christ said and did in the last week. In the 12th chapter, he's in great dispute with the, uh, with the Jews. 
you'll notice, for example, the first parable climaxes in verse 9. What will the Lord of the vineyard do? He'll come and destroy the husbandman. He'll give the vineyard unto others. He'll destroy the husbandman. Come back, please, uh, to the previous chapter. Look at the 13th verse. Seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves, he came if happily he might find anything thereon. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. <coughs> and he said, No man eat fruit of thee henceforth forever. And his disciples heard it. And uh, it says in the 20th verse, The fig tree dried up by the roots. The fig tree is a symbol of the Jewish nation. Plenty of foliage, flaunted its leaves, lots of ceremonies no fruit so this is an acted out parable no fruit grow on you henceforth forever the fundamentalist view is so popular in America and held by some in Australia that the Jews are still God's chosen people and he's going to put them back in Palestine they're going to rebuild the temple <clears throat> they'll receive an outpouring of the Holy Spirit they'll win more conversions to Christ than the Christian church has done in 2000 years there's not a text of the New Testament to support it when the Jews said, his blood be on us and our children, they left the theocracy. They left the covenant. They became as Gentiles. And when Christ said, no fruit grow in you henceforth forever, that's talking about the nation. As individuals, they're the same as individual Australians, individual Americans, individual Chinese. Christ died for them. God loves them. <laughs> but as a nation, their day is over. So Christ says in Matthew twenty one forty three, the kingdom of God is taken from you. Taken from you. No fruit grow on you henceforth forever. His blood be on us and our children. See? So you've got note after note of judgment in the acts of Christ, about the fig tree, the parables of Christ. Uh, if you look at Matthew 24, notice how it closes. Verse 48 on, if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming, shall begin to smite his fellow servants, eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looks not for him, and now he is not aware of, he will cut him asunder, point him his portion with the hypocrites, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then you've got three parables, they all have the same theme. The parable of the bridegroom and the ten virgins, and it reaches its climax in verse 10. They that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. And then verse 12, he says, I know you not, the ones that come late. Then 14 on, another parable, reaching a climax in 19. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. Judgment. And then finally, <laughs> the most graphic description of the last judgment in the whole Bible, 31 to the end of chapter 25. The sheep and the goats, and you notice they get into heaven or they're shut out of heaven on the basis not of whether they're good at biblical apocalyptic, not on whether they know theology, but inasmuch as you did it or you did it not unto one of the least of these, my brethren. In other words, the way you and I treat the least person we know in society's estimate is an evidence of whether we begin to God, belong to God. If there's any young lady here that's contemplating marriage, she should often have her beau take her to a cafe, not to have a good meal, but to see how he treats the waitress. Inasmuch as you do it under one of the least of these, you do it under me. Now this passion week is full of stories of judgment and acts of judgment. We've looked at a few of them. There are more than that. He cleanses the temple. But every proclamation, every act during this week outside of his own little group of disciples is an act of judgment. This is another feature of Passion Week that makes it foreshadow the end of of time when judgments 
will fall on the world. Now, let me apply it as we will find it as we study Revelation. The book of Revelation foretells the time when the gospel, like the triumphal entry, will polarise the world. We'll look at the example. Have a look at Revelation 18. <coughs> Andrew, would you kindly read us verses 1 to 4 of 18, please? After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried out with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. And she has become a dwelling place of demons, and a prison of every unclean spirit, and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. For all the nations have drunk the wine of the passion of their immorality, and the kings of earth have committed acts of immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. And I heard another voice from heaven, saying, Come out of her, my people, that you may not participate in her sins, and that you may... <laughs> Thank you. So here's a symbolic figure coming down from heaven, great power, and the earth is lightened with his glory and he gives a message of judgment. Verse 4, people are called out, unless, unless. And the fifth verse is, her sins have reached under heaven. Here's a picture of the ungodly world, Babylon. God's remembered her iniquities. So here's a great message coming down, warning the world on the eve of judgment. Look at chapter 14. Chapter 14. Joel, when you have it, would you like to read us in chapter 14, verses 6 and 7, please, Joel? Then I saw another angel flying in mid-air, and he had a big eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the spring of water. Thank you. Here's a similar picture. A messenger in the midst of heaven, the everlasting God. To everybody. You know, that was a pretty courageous prediction for a man working in the salt mines of Patmos to make. A man that knew that Christians were being thrown to the lions and dipped in tar and set alight as beacons in the beer gardens of the emperors. He says, don't worry, don't worry, my faith one day is going to go to every nation, kindred, tongue and people. we look at one more, chapter 10, and Rita, would you kindly read us this one? I'll give you the verses. Uh, in Revelation chapter 10, Notice, please, uh, from verse 1, 1 to 3, please, Rita. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun, and his legs were like fiery pillars. He was holding a little scroll, which lay open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, and he gave a loud shout, like the roar of a lion. When he shouted, Spoke. And reader, would you please add verses 6 and 7? And he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it, and said, There will be no more delay. But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished, just as he announced to his servants the prophets. Thank you. So here's an angel spending land and sea, the little book of the gospel open, making a proclamation. He says, delay no longer. Finish. Everything predicted is going to have its fulfillment. So this is like the triumphal entry of Christ, a final proclamation. And what will it do? Look at chapter 11, please. And let's notice verses 7 to 11. Uh, Lyndon, would you kindly read the 7 to 11 of chapter 11? Now when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the 
fits to attack them and overpower and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the streets of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, men from every people, tribe, and every nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse to wear them. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts, because these two prophets have tormented those who live on the earth. But after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and terror struck those who saw them. Thank you. So when this testimony that's been mentioned in chapters 10, and we find also in 18 and 14, is proclaimed the beast that rises out of the bottomless pit. Bottomless pit's a symbol of death. This is a persecuting power. Beast's a symbol of nations, national power. And nations will make war on those that give the testimony of God and apparently succeed in overcoming them. See, that is the picture. By the way, is the sheet still going around? If it's finished, I'll take it back here. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Now, let's look at 13, what's known as the Antichrist chapter of the Bible. And Graham, would you kindly read us, please, here in 13. Uh, let's read from verse... 12, down to the end, please, Graham. Here's a description of the final work of Antichrist when the gospel message has been proclaimed and the world is being polarised and those that don't like it say, let's get rid of these nuisances. They're disturbing the peace of the globe. Thank you, Graham. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs, so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those, by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image of the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark of the, or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Thank you. Six in the Bible is uh, in symbolic context, is a symbol of evil. <clears throat> the serpent was made on the sixth day. And when man, also made in the sixth day, comes under the control of the serpent, there's always great trouble. When Nebuchadnezzar condemns the Old Testament saints to death, he has an image that's three score cubits, 60 cubits by six cubits, has six musical instruments playing. And when Goliath comes against David, he has six different items of um, weaponry upon him. His spearhead weighs 600 shekels of iron and he's six cubits tall. When Solomon's at the height of his apostasy, <coughs> the money coming into his treasuries are 600 and 600, 666 shekels, or the equivalent thereof. So this is a very mysterious number saying a concentration of evil. Three sixes, because Revelation's written in, in counterfeit form. You have the lamb, you have the beast. The lamb is wounded to death, the beast is wounded to death. The lamb ultimately is going to be crowned, so the beast wears crowns. There's the father, the son, and the spirit. There's the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. There's a beautiful Jerusalem. There's a terrible Babylon. There's the bride clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet on the head of crown of 12 stars. And then there's the courtesan woman with a cup of drugs to inebriate the world. Everything's in opposite. Here you have the mark and the seal. Earlier we're told that the mark of God is God's name on the forehead. 
if you look at the very next chapter, maybe seeing Graham's read us that, we can go on to the 14th chapter. Uh, notice the first verse. Out of the din of the conflict, a lamb stood on Mount Zion with him 144,000 having the Father's name written in their foreheads. The ultimate mark of God is the name of God, the character of God. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness, and forgiving iniquity and sin, yet will by no means clear the guilty, those that don't repent. You see, the mark of God. The only reason we're in the world is to be temples of God. The only reason for our continued existence is that we might become like Christ and thus become a mighty influence. So the mark of the beast has to be the opposite of that. The mark of the beast means that people will ripen into the character of Satan who was a murderer and a liar from the beginning. There will be outward signs of this against the law and the gospel, just as there will be outward signs of the character of God. But ultimately the mark and the seal point to whether we have the character of the opposing parties. Now there's something very interesting in this description that Graham has read to us about setting up an image and enforcing a mark. <coughs> One of the greatest of commentaries that's still available and only ever by the complete set, unabridged, Jamison, Fawcett and Brown, tenderly known as JFB. That's one of the best commentaries available. And it says on this chapter that it is based on the history of Antiochus Epiphanes. Now Antiochus Epiphanes means nothing to most Christians. To Jews it means a tremendous amount and that's what Hanukkah is about. We all know about Hanukkah in this time of great rejoicing but do we know what it sprang from? Back in 167 BC, one of the kings that came out of divided Greece had the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. And coming back from an attack on Egypt, he trampled through Israel and entered the temple to the consternation of the Jews. He proceeded to do worse. He set up an image in the temple. That's where this image imagery comes from in Revelation 13. And the image of the Jews became known as the abomination of desolation. The word abomination is a word for an idol. <coughs> desolation, when idol worship leads to persecution. There were about three and a half years, or if you go way back to where Antiochus first becomes a threat, it runs out nearly seven years, about 2,300 days. But three and a half years of intense persecution, and 40,000 Jews are murdered by Antiochus. Terrorism is nothing new, is it? 40,000, that's more than a handful. I grew up in Townsville, and there was only 30,000 when I was a boy, and I thought it was big, because I was tiny. 40,000 Jews are wiped out because they would not bow to the decree not to keep the Sabbath. They would not bow to the decree not to read the scriptures. <laughs> they would not bow to the decree not to circumcise their children. But some Jewish patriots from a family as known as the Maccabees <coughs> gathered all the loyal Jews and wiped out the Syrian army of Antiochus and cleansed the sanctuary. Can anyone tell me where that's commemorated in the Gospel of John? Don't lose Revelation, but come back to the Gospel of John and chapter 10. Look at verse 22. And it was at Jerusalem, the Feast of Dedication, and it was winter. That's Hanukkah. Every Bible commentary will tell you that's Hanukkah, when they rededicated the sanctuary they had cleansed from the image and from the false worship. Now, Revelation 13 is saying, what happened back there is going to happen on a big scale. But what about the mark of the beast? Antiochus not only made them worship the image, 
they had to have a mark stamped on their wrists and the back of their hands. And it was the mark of Bacchus, one of the gods worshipped by Antiochus. You can read all about this in the books of Maccabees. If some of you have a New English Bible, some editions of the New English Bible have the Apocrypha at the back. If not, you can get one anywhere from any library. The Apocrypha does not claim inspiration. It was written when the voice of prophecy was silent from the time of Malachi to the coming of Christ. Some of the books in there are accurate historically. Others are a bit exaggerated. Some of them have uh, wisdom literature. Some of them parabolic. <clears throat> but in the books of Maccabees, it's about these events done by the Maccabean family. This is the last time the Jews had an independent state until 1948 when the Maccabees cleansed the sanctuary after being defiled all these days and the daily had been taken away and the offerings stopped and they'd been forced to receive the mark of the beast and participate in image worship. You see how important it is to understand the Old Testament history Though all this about Antiochus is only found in prophetic form in the book of Daniel. And it may be, if some of you are interested, we may consider the possibility of doing another course sometime on Daniel, in which we'll spend time on this, because you can't understand the book of Daniel without that. And I should say something extra about the book of Daniel, seeing we've introduced it. It's been a storm center for a long time. Was it written in the 6th century or was it written in the 2nd century? Evangelicals for a long time fought for the 6th century. Today, most evangelical scholars would say, and most liberal scholars would say, that the vast amount of the book does belong to about the 6th century, but that it was edited under the inspiration of God. You know, Hebrews 1 says, at sundry times, divers man as God spake. Most of the Old Testament books had some editing, that's why you'll find statements like unto this day, done under inspiration, done by the moving of God to make them relevant for all time instead of some things of local relevance. And the book of Daniel seems to have elements from the 2nd century, though most of it comes from the 6th. That's where most first-class evangelical scholars are today and many of the liberal scholars. And the important point isn't when it was written, but... How important was this book? It's the most important book as regards influence on the New Testament. From Daniel, Christ took his title, the Son of Man. From Daniel, Christ took his theme, the Kingdom of God. From Daniel, Christ took his reference to Judgment Day. From Daniel, Christ took a statement about resurrection from the dead. He quoted in chapter 5 what's found in Daniel chapter 12. So Daniel, of all the books in the Old Testament, is the most influential on the New Testament. And it's particularly influential on Revelation. No one can fully understand Revelation without Daniel. Well, why didn't we start with Daniel? Because we are, first of all, Christians, not Jews. Both books are tremendously important. But Revelation is the last word. And we've put the last first in this, this instance. But you can't understand it without Daniel. Earlier we've said that one of the clues to interpreting Revelation is the Old Testament passages that are used in this book. And there are several reasons for this. Christians thought in these categories, but there's another reason. In Ecclesiastes 3 verse 15 it says, That which is to be hath already been. You've all thrown a stone into the water, You've seen the expanding circles. Well, history is somewhat like that. I'll give you a, bi a Bible example. Abraham has a clash with one of the pharaohs. He's in danger of losing his life because the pharaoh wanted Abraham's wife. But God says to Pharaoh, don't touch her. She's the wife of a prophet. And Abraham goes out from Egypt with a lot of wealth, while the Egyptians are threatened with great plagues if they do the wrong thing. Hundreds of years later, 
Abraham's family is back in Egypt under another pharaoh. And this pharaoh is about to wipe them out and God says, I'll plague you if you try. And the ten last plagues come. And Abraham's family goes out now. Thank you. Abraham's family goes out now with much wealth. The centuries pass and the family goes back into Babylon. But after 70 years, they come out and the Babylonian kings give them a lot of wealth to come out in. Finally, the passage read, I think, by Andrew says, when the final proclamation of glory is made, there's a message come out of her, my people. God's people are being called upon to separate from everything that's evil because all that's evil is about to be burnt up. So that which is to be hath already been. Everything the future holds has happened in the past in miniature. Now that's where we began this hour. The pattern of Passion Week is the pattern of the end of the world. Final proclamation, polarizes the world, union of church and state, death decree, little time of trouble, close probation, great time of trouble, ultimate deliverance and the resurrection. Lester, thank you for that reminder. We have time for some questions before we take a break. Thanks, Lynn. Please, don't, don't be shy. You, Romans 11. You do well to raise that passage. It's the most important passage on the topic from one viewpoint. Let's look at it. Romans 11. Please observe what it says down verse 23. If they abide not still in unbelief, they'll be grafted in. God is able to graft them in again. Verse 25, the last part, blindness in part has happened to Israel till the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, they'll come out of Zion, the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. What's he saying? Well, let's put one or two other verses with it. Chapter 11, verse 2, God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. In other words, God still loves them. Verse 4, I've reserved myself 7,000 men who haven't bowed the knee. Chapter 9, please. Verse 8, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise accounted for the seed. The end of this chapter, verse 31 on. Israel that followed after the law of righteousness has not attained to it. They sought it not by faith, as it were by the works of the law. Chapter 10, Christ is the end of the law for everyone that believeth. But verse 3 is the contrast. They, Israel, being ignorant of God's righteousness, going about to establish their own, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. What's Paul saying? He's saying, look, I'd rather die if it could bring my people to Christ. And God loves the Jewish people, and the door's open for individuals to come back. And in 11, he's expressing the hope again and again and again that many Jews will return. And I think I mentioned it earlier, more Jews have been won for Christ in the last 15 years than the whole previous 2,000. There are some surprises. A lot of Christians don't know, for example, there are millions of Christians in the Arab world. The chief Arab country is Egypt, where there are millions of Christians known as Coptic Christians. Lebanon, which has 3 million people, has large numbers of Arab Christians. But more Jews have been won for Christ in the last 15 years than the previous 2000. The passage in Romans is expressing the hope that individual Jews will repent and that ultimately all Israel will be saved. But now he's using Israel in the sense that Romans 9, 8 has made plain. You're only a true Israelite if you belong to Christ. The last verse of Romans of Galatians 3, if ye are Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed. The last verse of Romans 2, whose circumcision is not of the flesh, but of the spirit. So I think, Sue, what Paul is saying there, I hope, I pray, I work that many Jews will come to Christ. And they will. But I do not think it's here a promise about a nation coming back to Palestine. I do not think anyone can find one verse in the New Testament, about Israel being restored as God's nation. They have a right as a nation to Palestine, just as the Arabs have a right to a nation state. 
But that doesn't mean that they're now God's theocracy any more than Australia is. And we're a godless nation if ever there was one. So I think he's expressing the hope of Jews yet being saved, but he's not saying they're coming back to Palestine to build the temple. Any other question? Please, Greg. Uh, uh, numerology, uh, this week talked about... 666? Six, six, six. Yes. Right, that's an excellent question. Yes, it's an excellent question. Let me give you one or two illustrations. The number seven first occurs at the beginning of the Bible associated with completion, perfection and rest. When you come to the last book of the Bible, which is about the completion of the whole show, and a new perfection ushered in, and rest. 54 of them. When we come to Passion Week, seven days, and on the cross, a mini week of seven hours, he's being taken down after the sixth hour to rest on the seventh in Joseph's new tomb. And while there, he utters seven sayings. There are seven testimonies to his, to his innocence, if you trace them through, Pilate and Herod, Pilate's wife, Centurion, those with him, Judas, there are seven confessions of the innocent and seven indictments. Some say there are seven trials. That's a little difficult to prove. If he had an interview with Caiaphas before the night Sanhedrin, there were seven trials. Annas, Annas and Caiaphas, evening Sanhedrin, morning Sanhedrin, Pilate, Herod, back to Pilate. Uh, Take the number 12, 12 sons of uh, Jacob, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles of Christ. Kingdom city has 12 foundations. It's the kingdom number, see? So it is the constant thematic repetition of certain numbers that has led most Bible scholars to say certain numbers have particular symbolic significance in symbolic settings. This is not to endorse Ivan Pannon, who took this to a great extreme and found the numerical equivalence of every word, for example, in chapters of Matthew and other parts of the New Testament and tried to build a case there. That's very artificial because no one knows. See, there are millions of textual variants. They don't affect the meaning of the text. They'll have an article this place instead of having the blue coat blue coat the and things of that nature or wrong spellings. Less than half of 1% of the text of the New Testament is open to doubt. Less than half of 1%. But that one half percent affected by textual variance wipes out Ivan Tannen's, Tannen's attempts. So I guess it's like everything. You've got the two extremes, neglect it or blow it up too high. In the middle you have the Bible saying he that has wisdom count the number. So they do have meaning. Any other question? Please, Graham. In, in Revelation 13, 18, it says here, the 666 is the number of a man. Now, yeah. know, I've met commentators and all sorts of men that they yeah. allocated. Nero and the Caesars and all sorts. Yeah, yeah. all sorts. So, 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 I mean, what's your view on it? You, it? It should read, it is the number of man, just M-A-N. It is the number of man. Not a specific man. No, man, man. that's right. In other words, man in apostasy against God as man is made on the sixth day and the serpent, so at the end of the world the serpent controls all of mankind with the exception of a little flock. Yeah. No, it doesn't mean anything. And we'll talk much more about it when we get to it as we go through Revelation. Any other question? I just want you to see, please. Yes, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, and we may talk about this more in detail later, talks about the man of sin sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, his picture of Antichrist. And while Protestants have used it of Catholics all through the ages, and Catholics have used it of Protestants, its ultimate meaning is finally, the last times, the final Antichrist. But it goes on to say, he that letteth, will let, until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Who is this? He that letteth, will let. Old English. He that restrains, 
will restrain until he be taken out of the way. I've done a lot of writing on this, but let me sum it up in a nutshell. The Holy Spirit in the world moves on the hearts of even unbelievers. What is known as common grace, otherwise our dangerous world would be a hundred times more dangerous. The Holy Spirit everywhere is working to restrain the worst depths of wickedness from becoming universal to give the gospel a chance to go to the world. But once the gospel has gone to all the world and the Holy Spirit accompanies it and men have made their decision, then the Holy Spirit withdraws, never withdraws from the God's people. He'll abide with you forever. But he withdraws from moving on the hearts of unbelievers and then this world will be turned into a charnel house then this world will become as symbolized in Revelation 16. And we're talking about rivers of blood, symbolism of war. Do you find what parallels do you find in Christ's experience on the cross to this man? I think the main parallel, I think the main parallel is when he says, not my will, but thy will be done. So he has made his decision. And after that, when the, is, the Jews say, blood be on us and our people, there is no restraint to the wickedness of men and what they do to Christ. So they strip him and whip him, they, they crucify him, they jeer at him. There's no restraint anymore. They, the world's just gone rotten, as rotten as could be. Here's the one Jew that's kept the law perfectly, who's been love incarnate, that's raised their dead, healed their sick, opened the eyes of the blind, restored hearing to the deaf, and they spit upon him and they jeer upon him. See, So all hell is let loose. Uh, Proverbs chapter 1 talks about this and other passages of scripture do, do also. When we talk about the unpardonable sin, the unpardonable sin is not a sexual sin, it's not murder, it's not profanity. The unpardonable sin is a continual rejection of the pleading of God when we so often refuse his conviction that ultimately we can't hear him anymore. We keep slamming the door until it jams. Matthew 12 talks about this. Whoever speaks against the Son of Man will be forgiven him. Whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit won't be forgiven him. It's not a particular act. All sorts of people have had all sorts of troubles. Some are suicide. I think they committed the unpardonable sin. If you're worried about it, you haven't done it. <laughs> Once you've done it, you're never worried about it. You've gone too far. See? You know the old story, people's conscience is good as new because they've never been used. Once the conscience has been cauterized, it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel anything, see? So ultimately, when the gospel has been proclaimed under the power of the Spirit and the world has made its decision and they condemn to death the people that give it, that jams the door. Holy Spirit can speak no more. Finish, close the probation. Then the last plagues, and they're called the last plagues.